The February 11, 2020 meeting of the San Luis Hill Planning Commission is called to order. Will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please note that all commissioners are present uh, this evening except Commissioner Samudzi. <coughs> Is there any request for a change uh, or revision of the order of any agenda items by any of the commissioners? Hearing none, uh, I'll go ahead and talk about the, the meeting tonight and the, uh, uh, the meeting procedures. First, I want to mention that the uh, there is an item on the agenda, the 190 Mill Street, that is scheduled for a public hearing. Staff has requested that that matter be continued, and I will entertain a motion uh, from the commission to, to continue that matter to the date certain of February 25, 2020. So if anybody is here tonight for uh, that pu public hearing, uh, stay tuned. It will, will probably be continued to February 2025. 20, uh, if, there, if for some reason we have to go forward with the, with the public hearing, I will announce the procedures for that public hearing uh, at, at that time. The, uh, the second public hearing uh, item on the agenda is the preliminary consideration of General Plan 2040 land use map uh, changes. Uh, that is not an application by an, indivi uh, an individual applicant for entitlements. Therefore, there will not be any presentation by an applicant uh, for, that, for that matter. There will be a, a time for public in input. I contemplate that there would be uh, a presentation by staff followed by an opportunity for planning commissioners to ask questions of staff. Then we would open it up for public hearing and then bring it back to the um, planning commission for discussion. The com uh, planning commission is not going to take any action on this uh, on this item tonight, but it will provide oral comments uh, to staff concerning the matters uh, addressed in the in the staff report, and then the the final uh, matter uh, at which time the public will have an opportunity to wish to speak if they so wish is a, the continued uh, annual meeting of, of the planning commission to consider some changes to uh, the rules governing uh, the operation of the planning commission. With that, I will ask, is there anybody in the audience now that wishes to address the commission as a matter of urgent communication on a matter not on the agenda? Seeing none, I'll move on to the uh, 190 Mill Street item and request a motion to continue that matter to February 25, 2020. Do I have a, a motion to that effect? Uh, I'll move to continue the 190 Mill Street matter to February 25th. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, is there any further discussion on the matter? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The matter continues. The matter is continued to February 25, 2020. The next uh, item is the preliminary consideration of the general plan 2040 land use map, including proposed amendments, uh, both by those initiated by uh, the staff and those initiated by landowners who are requesting changes to the designation on the owner's particular parcel. And I'll turn Chair, this. Chair, um, Schofler, uh, you, you, you read, sorry, <laughs> the minutes for January 28th. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Okay, turning back to the consent calendar. Uh, we have the minutes of January 28, 2020. Have commissioners had a chance to review those? Are there any proposed changes to the minutes? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. second. There's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Oh, anyway, oh, excuse me, any abstentions? Abstain. Yeah, I'll abstain. Okay, uh, Commissioner Mercado abstains because he's not present at that meeting. Okay. And Schaefer. You don't? Okay. okay. And Schaefer. Okay. Schaefer and, and Mercado abstain. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Moving on to, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. We'll, we'll move on to the, to the general plan now and turn it over to staff. 
Good evening, commissioners. I will uh, be doing the presentation this evening and um, with my colleagues responding to your questions and comments. I'm Barry Miller, the consulting project manager for General Plan 2040. I think I've had the chance to meet most of you, but not everybody at the commission. We've been before you a few times to talk about our progress on the general plan update. Uh, for those who are less familiar with the project, we are updating the general plan 2020 to move the time horizon forward to general plan, sorry, to the year 2040, and uh, looking ahead 20 years into the future to think about what kind of place we want San Rafael to be. Uh, as you know, there are many state requirements that drive what's in your general plan, but there's also a lot of local discretion about what issues we can address, what policies we can adopt, and how we want our city to look and function. So uh, we are about two years into this process now, and we have uh, this evening a land use map that is preliminary that we'd like to present to you. Uh, we are going to highlight the changes between this map and the existing 2020 general plan map. Uh, there are a couple of changes that we particularly would like your feedback on. We're not asking for any formal action or decision at this meeting, but we do want to give the commission a chance to weigh in on this and uh, also give the public an opportunity to comment or weigh in or express any issues they'd like us to see addressed further uh, before we bring this map uh, forward. Uh, just in, in terms of our timeline, we are looking at publishing a draft general plan around uh, late May of 2020, and that will come back to you uh, this summer for public hearings along with the downtown precise plan and an environmental impact report. So we'll be keeping you busy during the summer months with public hearings. Uh, so I'm going to uh, go through a number of slides. Let's see if I can get this to play. always helps when you turn it on. Okay, uh, so we have, uh, just before we get into the map, just wanted to give you a quick update on where we are with the plan elements. So there are 16 different topic areas that are covered by the general plan. You see them listed here. Uh, the housing element is not part of this update. That's updated on its own cycle that is set by the state of California. Um, but we have, an, anytime you see a red check, that's an element where the policies have been drafted and there has been some steering committee conversation about the element. And uh, we have a 24 person steering committee. This commission is represented by Commissioner Davidson and uh, Commissioner Schopert is the alternate for that. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow evening where we're going to be talking about the community design policies and uh, the economic vitality policies. I think those are all the clicks. Uh, we have March and April and May meetings scheduled. We'll be talking about cultural, culture and arts, neighborhoods, downtown, and uh, San Rafael's first, actually, I think the, the country's first Jedi element, which is justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. This is part, uh, actually state requires that we have an environmental justice element in the general plan now. That's a, a new requirement. We're expanding the scope of that to look at a broader range of issues um, related to equity and inclusion in the city and in our, in our processes. So moving on to the map, which is the focus of tonight's meeting, uh, this is a mandatory part of the general plan. Every general plan in the state has a land use map and it shows conditions in the horizon year of the plan, which in this case is going to be 2040. Uh, we are required by state law to show on the map the distribution, location, and extent of land uses in other words, residential, commercial, industrial, and so on, and then uh, standards of population density and building intensity. And what that means, this, this is quotes from the government code, what that means in effect is that we have to have uh, a, a range of categories for our residential and non-residential uses that expresses, for example, the number of units per acre allowed in residential areas and the uh, size of commercial and, and industrial buildings in those areas, uh, open space, public, quasi-public, et cetera. Uh, we have color-coded categories that correspond to each of those uses. There is a printed copy of the map on the easel behind me, and uh, there's a, a version of this that uh, this, the same map is available online for anyone who wishes to review it at home at sanrafel2040.org. The map is the basis for the zoning regulations. It's slightly different than the zoning map, but it is the framework for the San Rafael zoning map. 
So just for kicks, we put the 1963 general plan map in to kind of show you how far we've come. This map was done uh, when we had different values about the future of the city. Uh, take note of the shoreline freeway that connects the Richmond San Rafael Bridge touchdown to the rock quarry and continues on through the wetlands east of McGinnis Park. Uh, includes high density housing on the shoreline. So there was a very different vision back in the 60s when we were doing land use planning. Uh, the categories were also much more generalized. There were 10 land use categories on that uh, plan map. Uh, fast forwarding now to the 2020 general plan, which was done in 2004. There were 28 categories on the map. You see a lot more green on this map. And um, this essentially is, is, I think, where we're going with the new general plan. Most of the general plan designations and uh, the, the map designations are being carried forward. We are not making um, major changes. And I think this presentation highlights every change that's proposed at this point so you will get a full sense of, uh, of what is in store in this. Um, Note at the bottom right of the slide that there were 28 categories, including 13 different categories for mixed use development. Um, probably the biggest change to the map is that we're streamlining and simplifying a number of the categories. This is the, um, well it says 2020, meaning that's when we're presenting it, but it's the plan for 2040 with 19 categories. So we're consolidating a few of the categories. I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, primarily by using some more detailed planning documents for guidance in the downtown area and uh, using zoning for some of the more prescriptive differences in the, in the office category. Uh, so we're going to walk you through three different categories of amendments. First, we have changes to definitions. Second, we have staff-initiated amendments. And third, we have applicant-proposed amendments. The uh, change to definitions includes a shift for the residential categories from gross density to net density. And I'll explain a little bit about what that means. Um, when a city is growing primarily by annexing large tracts of vacant land, green fields we call them, or open space, and then subdividing those areas with internal streets and parks and schools, um, the typical metric that you would use is gross density. So on this particular uh, photograph, that large area inside the red, which is maybe a couple hundred acres, um, you would say the gross density inside that shape is five units per acre or, or whatever. Um, that's the total, for, for calculating the total number of units inside that, that area. Um, but And that is the standard that the metric that San Rafael currently uses and has used for the last 60 years is that gross density standard because the earlier general plans were done at a time where the city was still annexing and developing large tracts of land for single family subdivisions. Uh, at this point, most cities in the Bay Area have switched to a net density standard which recognizes that the, um, the streets are there. We're in the mo in for the most part, we are developing infill sites that are already uh, served by street frontage and that are not going to have a whole lot of interior street acreage uh, associated with them. And so the difference between gross and net is one includes the streets and the other one doesn't. Um, here's another illustration. This is a, a five acre uh, random square in Terra Linda. We just drew a square around an, an area. Um, on the left, you see the gross density, which is how basically uh, based on the total five acres inside that square, and that's 4.4 units per gross acre. On the right, you see the, um, the net acreage, which is slightly shaded. It excludes the streets. It's 5.7 units per net acre because we're only basing the acreage on the developable, the developable area or the, the developed area, in this case, and not on the public rights of way. Um, the point I'm making with this is that they're the same number of units, so the density is effectively the same density. It's just calculated uh, slightly differently. Um, because the undevelopable land is subtracted out in the net density calculation. And we don't anticipate a lot of greenfield or open area development. Pretty much everything moving forward is on land that, with, with a couple of exceptions, is on land that is already either developed or was previously developed or is already served by street frontage and is not going to have a large system of internal streets, uh, hence the, the, the switch. Um, what this does mean is that the general plan categories are now going to align perfectly with the zoning categories. So um, because we, the zoning categories is based on how big the parcel is or 
uh, essentially can you put a 5,000 square foot lot or a 7,000 square foot lot. That's the metric that we're switching to in the general plan. It's kind of a complicated concept to get your head around, but um, uh, we'll let it sit for a while. So um, other category changes are mostly consolidations of the existing general plan categories. As you're aware, we're doing a downtown precise plan. Uh, on the general plan map, there are six, the old general plan map, the 20, 2020 plan that was adopted 16 years ago. There are six different categories for downtown San Rafael and we're consolidating those into a single category called downtown mixed use. Uh, there's a much higher level of detail for that area that will be in the precise plan, which will be adopted concurrently with the general plan. And so rather than adding all of those um, detailed categories in the general plan map, that will be in the precise plan. There are three office categories in the current general plan. They will be collapsed into a single category called office, mi office mixed use. Uh, the important thing to point out here is that those three categories will still exist in the zoning regulations. And so you will continue to have an office, a commercial a retail office and a residential office zoning district and there will be guidance in the general plan about where those zones are mapped. But you don't have to have three separate office categories on the map. Um, in the light industrial, the Lindaro mixed use and light industrial office are being combined into the light industrial office. And the definition of light industrial office specifically states that in the Lindaro and Jordan Street area that um, a separate zone applies where mixed use development and live work is permitted. Um, it, it is not necessary for a 13 acre area to have an entire general plan map category. So we've consolidated that. Uh, we've also consolidated the parks and open space category into one category called parks and open space. This area already has one zoning district, which is P uh, slash OS parks and open space. And so there is no rezoning required. This essentially is aligning the general plan with the zoning designations. In the parks and open space element of the general plan, there's a more detailed map that classifies open space and parks into different categories, such as uh, passive open spaces and community parks and neighborhood parks and regional parks and so on. It's not that the information is being lost. We are aiming for a more legible and usable general plan map. Uh, I wanna add also that this discussion was also vetted with our general plan steering committee. It has been about a year and a half since we had that discussion and they provided some great feedback which we've incorporated in the categories that you see here and that we've mapped. We've also added a sea level rise adaptation overlay. Again, I think we're the first city in California to do this, that um, kind of scalloped black line that you see on the map on the right. This is Southeast San Rafael um, along the 580 and 101 corridors. Um, that is the high water mark in a 100 year flood given the 2050 sea level rise projections. Uh, it's a little frightening when you see how far inland that is. Essentially everything seaward of that line is subject to flooding in a 100 year storm plus high tide sea level rise in the year 2050. So we have policies in the general plan that address the area that would be impacted that both seek to mitigate hazards and also make the area more resilient to rising uh, sea level. Okay, I'm gonna move now into the staff initiated amendments. I've got uh, maybe eight slides that cover these amendments and uh, we're not gonna go through each one, but we've uh, tried to group them into categories. Uh, the first category being, um, this is kind of a, a technical old fashioned cartographic term called Scrivener's errors, which are unintentional map errors. I think what happened um, when the general plan map was digitized from a paper map to a computer based map uh, there were a number of errors that were made uh, in the digitizing and we've corrected those through this process. I wanna call your attention to a single family lot on um, uh, in the Terra Linda neighborhood that is shown in that circle. It's a, you can see a picture of the house at the bottom right. That is um, not actually a park, it's a single family home. Um, the park is actually located immediately north of that in the Freitas Parkway right of way. It's, it's uh, really more of a mini park and so we've corrected the map and voila, the uh, lot is being shown as low density residential and the mini park is being shown correctly in the Freitas 
Parkway right of way. So we've, there are about a half dozen of these that we've identified and we've, uh, we've made those corrections through this map. So these really aren't amendments, they're I think corrections uh, to previous mapping errors. Uh, expanded mapping of public uses. So there's a category in the general plan and there has been for many years called public, quasi-public, which is intended to identify public buildings and public properties. Um, that designation was not applied in the past to school campuses, public school campuses. Strangely, it was applied to private school campuses but not public school campuses. Um, we are now mapping all public school campuses with the public, quasi-public designation including the Miller Creek schools and the San Rafael schools, uh, also s various city and county buildings, some of which were not yet acquired as of 2004, which is why they still have uh, old designations. Um, for example, the uh, Sheriff and Police uh, County Center on Los Gamos, the Public Works Center on Morphew. Um, there are a couple of um, MMWD water storage tanks that are um, designated for residential uses, which we're designating public and so on. So that's, these again are more clarifications um, and we have met with the school district and, and um, talked through this designation. They, are, they have the majority of the properties that are affected by this. Uh, we've expanded the mapping of park and open space areas. There's actually been quite a bit of open space acquisition in the 16 years since the last general plan was updated. Um, most of these are in the county and I should point out that the general plan map is not just what's in the city limits of San Rafael, it's also the sphere of influence and the unincorporated planning area, which includes places like Marinwood, Lucas Valley, uh, Los Ranchitos, the Santa Venetia area. We don't have land use jurisdiction over those areas, but we do have some long range planning and policy jurisdiction, and our general plan map shows those areas. So we wanna get it right. Um, the map at the bottom right and the photograph, kind of the lower half of the photograph is Buck's Landing, uh, kind of on, on the edge of China Camp State Park. Um, Marin County Parks has acquired about 100 acres um, on Heron Hill and in this area and that was all previously designated for lower density, actually hillside uh, resource density residential uses. So that's being reclassified as parks and open space. And there are about 10 areas where um, we have made the, this change. Uh, we're also designating cemeteries as park and open space. Um, obviously the open space element there is, uh, is what's driving that. Uh, there are a number of amendments that are being made to show actual densities and some of these are fairly recent projects where the general plan map didn't need to be changed to accommodate a project. But um, at this point in time, since we have an opportunity and we're kind of stepping back and looking at the city as a whole, uh, we think it makes sense to use best fit designations for some of these projects. Uh, you see that slide on the, the, the photo on the upper right is the 33 North project uh, near the Civic Center, which was developed just a few years ago. Uh, the site was formerly an office building and it had an office designation and uh, was redeveloped as multifamily housing, but the general plan designation was never changed uh, because office was, uh, residential was an acceptable use. Uh, we are proposing that that site be changed to high density residential to show it for what it is. Uh, conversely, that picture on the bottom uh, right is a subdivision of about maybe 20 or 30 lots in Santa Venetia, which is shown on the general plan as high density residential. Um, it's actually developed at 11 units per acre, which is medium density residential. So we're, we're kind of right sizing the general plan designations. And again, there are six or eight of these that we've identified on the map. Um, there aren't too many of these where we're at what I'm calling the seam between the low and medium residential areas. Uh, again, I'm gonna click and circle this area in Montecito uh, between Ridge and Union. Um, everything on uh, Ridge is low density residential except one parcel that's medium because it goes through the block. Uh, the zoning splits that parcel in half with a higher density zoning on the Union Street side. Um, and we're making the general plan consistent in this case so that the Ridge frontage is consistent in density and we don't end up with an inappropriately dense project on the one uh, site that may be vacant on, on Ridge there. Um, so that's the sort of change we're talking about in these cases. And there are a few of these in the Bret Hart and Montecito areas, but not too many citywide. 
Uh, there are two cases where we're uh, changing the designation of a site that is currently shown as low density to hillside residential, which is a less intense designation. Uh, one of those is on this slide. The other one uh, that's not shown is in Sun Valley. This is about five acres in Terra Linda off of Elda Drive, and um, you can see it there is um, the hillside residential designation, which is a less dense designation. Um, this is a fairly large site, and it's 40% average slope, and the hillside de designation is more appropriate given that constraint. Um, we have made two map changes in the Civic Center Station area, and this is in line with the, with the Civic Station, uh, the Civic Center Station area plan that was adopted uh, several years back, the public storage site, and then there's another self-storage site uh, just behind Guide Dogs for the Blind. Those are uh, located on the two sites that I just highlighted, and those would be changing from light industrial office to the office mixed use designation um, on, on the, uh, as part of the proposed package of amendments. This is an area that's already seen some multifamily residential development um, consistent with the station area plan. I'm going to move on now to the last set of amendments, which are the applicant-initiated amendment proposals. Uh, the city issued a call for amendments in April 2019. Uh, over the last decade or so, there have been various parties who have come in and said they wanted to do something or, uh, you know, were interested in an amendment um, because the current general plan wouldn't accommodate it. Um, th there's a kind of a running list, and everyone who was on that list received a notice. In addition, we did a press release and prepared a pamphlet and uh, e-blast and web um, material for anyone who was interested in a map amendment. Uh, we allowed a 10-week time uh, window of time for submittals and received four applications. We also received uh, some alternate wording from two property owners whose properties are directly addressed in the general plan, um, one being canal ways and the other being the rock quarry. Um, just requests to finesse the language in the plan on those sites, and we're considering that as well as language from the various neighborhood organizations for specific sites as well. Uh, I'm going to walk through each of the four applications, and uh, in this case, we're going to also uh, provide staff's recommendations, preliminary recommendations. Uh, again, we're not asking for the commission to decide per se, but we would like your thoughts and feedback on these applications and staff's um, direction. Uh, the first is a three-story office building at Kerner and Bellum, and this is uh, about a 25,000 square foot office building on the Bellum corridor. The request is to change the property from light industrial to community commercial mixed use, and as you can see on the uh, map at the lower um, on the lower part of the screen, that's the existing general plan. Most of the Bellum corridor is commercial, and uh, in considering this request, we also looked at the property across the street uh, where the Le Croissant is, and there's uh, several other businesses in that building, uh, and this one, I think I highlighted that. Uh, we are recommending actually that both of those properties be redesignated to community commercial mixed use. Uh, both consistent with the existing use and uh, recognizing that there is an opportunity for housing on these sites um, in the event that that's uh, something the property owners want to pursue in the future. The light industrial designation does not allow housing, but the community commercial designation does. It also allows the uses that are there now, so it's not creating nonconformities. It's essentially creating more opportunities, particularly in um, in an area that needs, uh, th that is in need of, no of additional housing. So we support that application and in fact it's expansion across Bellum. Application two was from Caltrans and they have requested that we apply designations to some of their properties in San Rafael that are leased to third parties for uh, various activities. Uh, they provided a map of properties and, and uh, suggested designations that matched the adjacent private designations. Uh, one thing to point out is that uh, most Cal all Caltrans property um, is undesignated currently, and we actually looked at this request in the context of how does everyone else in the 101 corridor treat Caltrans uh, right of way, and it looks it the 11 cities that we looked at from Sausalito to Santa Rosa, nobody designates the Caltrans right-of-way 
uh, because it's state land and we have very limited jurisdiction. Uh, with respect to leases, our uh, recommendation is that this be dealt with through policy uh, in the plan rather than creating a new designation or designating just bits and pre pieces, really um, fragments. I've highlighted uh, two here. Um, you can see them on the map and then on the aerial photo below. This is the Anderson underpass beneath 101 next to Marin Square. Um, there are a number of other locations in downtown San Rafael under the freeway. Um, and we uh, plan to work with Caltrans and make sure that they're comfortable with the language that we come up with that would address these situations uh, to make sure that the uses are compatible um, without going so far as to designate these properties um, with the general plan designation. Uh, the next is uh, 86 Culloden Park Road. This is a request to change a site that's a little less than an acre from hillside residential to low density residential. It's actually one home site that is split into two designations and uh, we support this recommendation. It essentially gives the property owner a, a single general plan designation. I'll highlight the site right there. And um, that, is, that is essentially to, to um, retain the same designation on their entire property. There's no zoning impact associated with this. Um, it is primarily a cleanup item. Uh, the final application is for 435 Dubois, which is da uh, Jackson's Hardware, and that's a 2.6 acre site with the 50,000 square foot hardware store. Uh, they have requested a general plan map change from industrial to general commercial. Uh, there is no plan to redevelop the site at this time, but the designation would provide more flexibility to p potentially redevelop the site with housing at some point in the future uh, or other commercial uses. Uh, staff is actually recommending not changing this site uh, because it is part of the core industrial area of San Rafael. It's, um, it's not light industrial office, it is actually industrial, which is the most intense designation and one which is fairly limited in supply. Uh, it, although this site is opposite multifamily residential on the other side of Woodland, it is adjacent to auto body shops and paint shops and uh, not that far from the, um, the concrete batch plant. Um, so our recommendation is that this re remain in its industrial designation at this time. Yeah. If I could just jump in as well. This, um, this sort of concept was also a topic of discussion with the steering committee early on about whether uh, some of our industrial areas, which happen to be in close proximity to the downtown uh, transit station, walkable, should be changed to allow for housing. And there was a lot of pros and a lot of cons that were um, expressed by steering committee members and staff's position is very indicated is that given our limited light industrial industrial base that we already have, it's too uh, valuable of a resource to give up because there's no other uh, major industrial base in Marin County. So then this application was kind of specific to one site, but we also talked about it as a larger policy issue in the steering committee. Last slide. <laughs> uh, so the, um, I think the, the, the protocol for this evening, our hope was that <coughs> we could get uh, clarifying questions from the commission, have an opportunity for public comment, uh, hear your comments on the land use categories, the staff initiated amendments and the applicant initiated amendments. Uh, we are gonna be doing a similar session with the council next Tuesday evening at their regular meeting and would like to incorporate the feedback from both the commission and council. As I mentioned, we'll be returning to the council uh, in several months when the draft plan is available. Uh, we will probably be back to the commission sooner than that because we, we would like to begin to be um, giving you pieces of the general plan in advance so that it's not as big a heavy lift when we deliver the s s several hundred page document to you with an EIR and the downtown precise plan. So um, we, will, uh, we will be back, I'm sure, before May and um, look forward to those conversations. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so what I'd like to do is give the commissioners a chance to ask questions here. And I think the uh, a logical way to proceed is to um, divide our questions along the three different topics. There's the change to definitions, there's the staff initiated changes, and there's the owner initiated uh, cha uh, changes. So if the commissioners wanna ask questions now of staff, if we could start with questions 
limit yourself to questions, no comments on the merits at, the, the, this, at this point. That'll come after the public comment about the change to definitions. So does anybody have questions about what's proposed by way of change to definitions? Um, I don't have any specific questions for that. I have questions unrelated that are not in those three categories. Uh, okay, well, it was okay if we reserve that to the, to, to the end, okay. Any, anybody have qu questions on, um, on changes to definitions? Okay, Mo moving on to the next uh, subtopic, then the staff initiated changes to the, uh, to the land actually, use. I, actually, I do have a, just a brief question. Apologies. Uh, I'm wondering as, as other cities and towns update their general plans, do you see a trend that there are these consolidations of definitions or is this something that's particular and unique to San Rafael? Uh, it is not particular and unique to San Rafael, but most of the other communities didn't have 28 categories to begin with. I think when we looked at, for example, Novato has 19 categories, Richmond and Hayward have 19 categories. There's sort of a sweet spot around 18, 19, 20 categories. When you start to get up to 28 categories, your general plan map begins to look like your zoning map and there's really little distinction between the two. And there are some smaller cities where that is the case, but in most of the cities that are in kind of the mid-sized range, like San Rafael, we're, we're kind of, I think where we're going with the revised plan is around the same number of categories that other like cities have. Great, thank you. Okay, I'll move on to the uh, next topic, which is the staff initiated changes. Do any commissioners have questions of staff about the staff initiated changes to the land use map? I have a question, I think, although I'm not sure <laughs> where, where this was. It was about, you were discussing uh, live work. Is that in this, cat? was that under this, the staff initiated changes that you were discussing live work? Uh, so we haven't made any changes with respect to live work. What we've done is taken, there's a Lindaro mixed use category on the current general plan map that only is mapped on Lindaro and Jordan and it allows live work as well as light industrial. And what we've done is we've combined that category with the light industrial category, but the definition says you can't do live work except in the Lindaro and Jordan Street area. So essentially we, we've kept the integrity of that uh, category, but we've just included it in the definition instead of on the map. I'm just curious, how much live work do we have in San Rafael? Um, not much. It did. Um, it was a concept that was uh, a pretty hot topic in the 2004 uh, general plan. It never came to fruition, um, but it's still something that I think we want to retain. Uh, part of that also is that we don't ha we have never fully developed our rules for live work. Um, and it's one of those kind of catch 22s where I think we need to see that the market is there to get a better understanding of what is desired to develop some more specific rules. So we have a, I would say, kind of interim live work regulations that need to be defined better, but we would wait until we actually see some projects so that we can um, have a better understanding of what sort of uh, regulations to put in. Thank you. Okay, last chance to ask questions about staff initiated changes. Seeing none, I'll move on to the last topic, which is the owner initiated changes. And um, so we have four different properties, just to remind uh, commissioners, 3301 Kerner, the miscellaneous Caltrans properties, 86 Culloden Park Road, which is a single residential site, and 435 Dubois, the Jackson's Hardware site. Do, uh, do any of the commissioners have questions of staff about uh, this category? Um, yes, Commissioner Davidson. You mentioned a couple of properties. One is the Canal Ways. And you said staff is still considering the change. Was that owner initiated or staff initiated? Yeah, just to clarify, we're not proposing any map design map changes to Canalways. The okay. map that the same designation that was applied in the last general plan will be carried forward. Okay. Um, but there's text in the general plan that talks about the future of that site, and the applicant submitted uh, re proposed revisions to that text that we are looking at, and okay. we will prepare some revision of that in the draft neighborhoods element when that's um, when that's prepared. So we're okay. not quite there yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lubomirsky. Thank you. Uh, so if, if we don't redesignate Jackson's industrial, if they were to come back 10 years from now and they wanted to pursue a housing there, 
how, I mean, how many times do we change a designation? How many times have we changed a designation in the past, say, 20 years? Is that, is that like completely off the table? It happens sometimes. Yeah, so I think what you're asking is how many times have we uh, done l land use map amendments to the general plan land use map? Um, I would say for specific projects in this current general plan, the 2020, there's probably only been about three to four actual land use map amendments. Off the top of my head, um, Dominican, when they purchased Magnolia House and incorporated in their campus, required a land use map change. The Loch Lomond Marina project, which was kind of part of the general plan 2020 adoption, required a land use map change. So it's pretty rare. Um, we we would consider we could con the, anyone can apply for a general plan amendment at any point, uh, but it's upon them to go through the process and provide supporting documentation. Uh, there is other kinds of general plan amendments that we also do see occasionally, as you just saw uh, a few weeks ago with the Biomarine Whistle Stop, which included some changes to a uh, height map and a, um, uh, a floor area ratio uh, policy. So there is also some text amendments, but the land use map itself is pretty rare. It might be, I mean, if, it were, if we're not granted at this time, it would make it considerably more expensive to go forward 10 years from now to have that whole process? Well, ye yes and no. Um, if somebody on their own is proposing to um, request a general plan amendment, they would need to carry the carry that application costs and provide all the supporting documentation. Um, but the city does on, f on, f on occasion relook at its general plan at five years, 10 years, 15 years and evaluate, are there changes needed in the general plan? Um, we, we don't have a 100% um, accurate crystal ball of where the community is gonna go over the next 20 years, so sometimes we have to make adjustments. If housing is at such an issue and light industrial market changes where maybe by itself light industrial uses are going away, the city can, can initiate its own general plan amendment and, and reconsider that those policies. Um, it's just at this time, staff's position at least is to maintain the the light industrial industrial base limited base that we have within the community other questions about uh, owner initiated uh, map changes i would um i would stay away from the caltrans designation mm -hmm. that just seems like once you open up that option for one constituent then why not for everyone else and they have different leasing options that may have a different ownership interest or state, federal, other. So I didn't see any interest at all. I, I don't see any compelling reason why we would do that. Any more on this topic? If not, Commissioner Loughran. So one of my questions is about the quarry land designation. And I believe the quarry is actually in the county and not in San Rafael. But as it's on the map, I thought I would ask. So one of my questions is it's the only place I see that it appears to actually have two designations in the same area so what I'm looking at is it's gray but it's also part of it's also green mm -hmm. and so can you explain can you talk about that sure okay uh, yeah and so the gray area is the mineral resources designation and the green area corresponds to the conservation designation which are the wetlands on the on the site and that's the current general plan designation for those sites which were for that site which we're carrying forward so we haven't changed anything there. You're correct, I mean, it is in the county, but in the sphere of influence, we're not anticipating any land use changes there during the time horizon of this plan. Um, that would be an example where if there was interest in changing the general plan, there would be an amendment process for the applicant to go through, the, you know, just uh, as they would for any other property. Um, but yes, there are, so there are two designations. It's 300 acres, um, so it's, it, it's large enough that we do want to start identifying the most environmentally sensitive areas on the site and calling those out. Okay, I guess I'm confused then. Why then is it designated both conservation and mineral resources at the same time? Uh, so the two designations shouldn't overlap. They're, they should be distinct shapes. There shouldn't be any areas where the green overlaps on top of the gray. Um, 
Okay, maybe it's a coloring of the map. Kay. It looks like it's both in the same location. Okay, we'll, ch we'll look at that. Scrivener's errors, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it could be my eyes, too. Okay. Um, so out of curiosity, though, I mean, based on when the quarry is scheduled to close at this point in time, and based on where quarry operations actually are right now, um, just curious why so much of that 300 acres is still going to be mineral resources in the general plan? So uh, the quarry currently has a valid um, operational permit. Uh, they have applied or are applying with the county to extend that permit. Um, and based on our understanding is that that extension would take it through the life of our current general plan. So given that, we did not see the need to make any land use map changes. Uh, and so the, the proposed land use map in this area is not changed from the general plan 2020 land use map for this area. Uh, in terms of why there's so much mineral versus conservation or open space, I think is what you asked. Um, because I think all that area that's mineral is mineable um, area per uh, the reclamation plan that they current that they had in in place back in 20, 2004 when we adopted the last general plan, and we we haven't made any changes because we don't have any uh, specific proposal that would show some other alignment of land use or intensity. So we're just leaving it as is. As Barry did mention, there is in every neighborhood. In, in the neighborhoods element for every neighborhood, there is some um, language about key sites, and one of those key sites for the for this portion of San Rafael would be the quarry, and there would be some language to kind of um, identify what, that it's uh, probably gonna remain a quarry during the life of the plan, as far as we know, but if once that changes, they'll have to apply for amendments, and the, you know, it could be turned into something like this or that, so we'd have to craft some sort of vision. We're receiving input from the neighborhood, we're also receiving input from the quarry itself on what that uh, text language would read like. Um, but it wouldn't be a land use designation granting them any right at this point until they come and apply. Thank you. Um, the other thing, could you put the map back up that you showed that showed the sea level rise? Uh, yes, it's gonna be a ways there. Yeah, I gotta stop there. Okay, we're gonna go straight to it instead of toggling back. Okay, my question about it is it you in that map, so I, I think what you said is those lines that look like the edge of bubbles <laughs> are, <Yeah. laughs> that's, that's where the 100 year, 100 year storm, 2050 sea level rise, 100 year storm um, would be. Yeah. Okay, so, but and that's showing it down for the light industrial area close to um, the St. Quentin exit. Do you have a similar map or overlay for the downtown area? We do. This is just a excerpt from a map that covers the entire city. Actually, the map that's on the wall behind me or the, on the easel is the entire city and continues that line all the way around. And I will also add that we're still working on the graphic presentation of this line. Uh, we've mapped it, but we're probably going to tweak it a little bit to make it more uh, readable and understandable that that's what it's communicating. Okay, thank you. I, yeah, I don't, I don't mind the bubbles. Um, I just want to make sure I knew what, th what it meant. Sure. So, um, okay, I see. Got it. Okay, all right. Thank you so much. All right, any other uh, questions before we turn it over to the, to the public? All right. Hearing none, uh, I invite the, the public to uh, come speak, and if you come to the microphone, a couple of rules. Please uh, put the microphone uh, close to where you're speaking so that we can hear you. Identify yourself, please. Sign in um, before you leave uh, in, uh, with, with your uh, your name there, and if you may, will, please try to limit your remarks to uh, uh, three minutes. At this point, anybody in the public wish to address the commission on the land use map changes on this uh, agenda item? Good 
Good evening, I'm Kathy Minovi. I, um, I'm a resident of the Raphael Meadows neighborhood, which is the Marydale area, and I'm here to talk about just concerns related to the rezoning of the two storage parcels. Um, as you probably are aware, but if not, it's important to keep in mind that both Marydale has two ways of getting in, and they both dead end at the, at the smart tracks. On the north end, you've got, we're planning to do, um, build out a promenade, which is going to restrict that roadway. And that roadway really does not have any internal cross streets. So if they're gonna be planning, say, high density housing, that should be in taken into consideration the impacts of, you know, you've got train traffic, people trying to get to the train, you've got people riding, walking, things of that nature. And then if you've got an increase of traffic going in and out, this could be a, a, a real conflict um, and lower the quality of life in that area. On the other side, um, where we have a lot of infill already, there's been infill happening over the last couple, th few decades in that area. There are projects that are in play right now that are being planned and built. Um, additional multifamily housing, high density. My concern there is there really is very, very poor um, walking and biking infrastructure on Marydale. Um, there's a lot of, this is gonna be an increase in traffic. So I wanna um, urge planners to really think carefully about this area, about what we allow to go, how much density we might allow to have, say if it turns out to be um, high density residential housing, to keep that in mind and make sure that planning is put in place to improve the walkability um, from the existing neighborhoods under the highway, um, south of the tracks to be able to walk to the farmer's market, the civic center, to get around to get to SMART without having to get into a car. Those kinds of things are of real concern in that area. So while this map looks great and you know the zoning, you know 43 per acre, units per acre, it, to me when I think about it and walk around in the area and struggle to you know not get hit by a car when you're walking or biking and looking behind you and there's there's really a narrow sidewalk only on one side. It's really a very poor area for um, a lot of infill if we're relying on the existing um, pedestrian and bike and car, I mean multimodal um, transportation options there. So hopefully if that planning does happen, which would be, from my opinion, a lot nicer than these storage um, that basically are pretty derelict. If you try to walk by there, sometimes there's you know vagrants in there smoking some kind of thing and you don't really want to walk there alone. And it would be an improvement in my mind to have that develop to a much nicer, more visible and um, transparent where people feel comfortable walking and being able to traverse from one neighborhood to the other. But again, there are impacts there. There are, rest there are restricting factors related to the existing roadway infrastructure. I just wanted to bring that to the, com um, to the commission's attention. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Kate Powers. I happen to be on the steering committee and I have uh, two concerns. One is similar to Kathy's in that um, going from a, uh, from the, let's see, <coughs> from the um, gross density to the net density, my concern is um, how does the general planning process um, plan for capacity? Um, because the gross density includes public streets, um, public parks, schools, and amenities um, as, as part of the density. Um, designation and net infill um, designation. Just not sure how that changes um, because I think there are a lot of areas w that are um, possible for change and in infill, um, but it's questionable about how our existing infrastructure uh, capacity is going to deal with that. And I agree that um, over in the area of the Civic Center station area, there's a lot of traffic getting onto the highway there, and if we continue to add housing density without um, a vision and a concrete plan on how we're gonna accommodate those folks both in schools and on the public streets and right-of-ways, um, I think we're, we're 
um, reducing the quality of life in certain areas. And then um, the last thing is just that um, I'm one of the proponents that thinks the industrial area um, over by Jackson's Hardware should um, be changed as the applicant has um, proposed. I do think that as we look forward that that if we want a walkable community that that is within the um, destination of the um, the new um, smart station downtown and I'm not sure where the transit of the three alternatives is going to end up but I think that we want to promote that in the near future as opposed to the long-term future and not make it a stumbling block. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the uh, uh, commission. Uh, and before we get started, I would just like to disclose that with respect to the owner-initiated uh, change of use at the Jackson's Hardware site. Um, I was a lawyer in San Rafael for 25 years in my firm and I personally represented Jackson's hardware, uh, but I did not do any work uh, related to their leasehold interest in, in the property and I don't have any reason to believe that I would couldn't be fair in evaluating uh, these uh, the matters that are before us tonight. Uh, so what I'd like to do with the commission now is, and I think this will make Mr. Miller's job easier is if we follow the same pattern that we did with the questions, which is we'll go topic by uh, topic. We'll start with the, um, uh, the, the changes to the definitions, and then we'll go on to the staff-initiated changes, and then the, the owner-initiated uh, land use map changes, if that's all right, if that's all right with, the, with the commissioners. So a first call for commissioners to offer any comments they might have with respect to the changes to the definitions. Does anybody want to kick that off? And if it's, I think it's fine to say uh, if, if, if you don't think, if you think staff's done, done okay and you don't have specific comments to make, that's okay also. I, I don't have, I think it's fine. Yeah, go with it. It seems like you've done a good job on that part of it. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's, let's move on to the, the topic of the staff initiated changes to the land use uh, map. Uh, and I think, uh, Commissioner uh, Mercado, you started out, you started to weigh in a little bit on that. No, I guess that was a, that was a Caltrans, it's the last category, pardon me on that. So on the staff initiated ch uh, changes, uh, does, uh, does any commissioner want to offer comments as to any of the, um, uh, the items that are discussed in that portion of the staff report? We did prepare, we did read it, but uh, I, I think the consensus is you've done a, a, a really good job on, on, on this and we're, we're, we're happy with what you've, what you've told us and, and think you're headed in the right direction. I, is that, I think that would be sort of the consensus comment from the, uh, from the dais. Okay, the last one, owner initiated. Uh, and um, so, um, uh, uh, this one, this one may engender some some discussion, and because uh, I know we had some discussion about Caltrans all already. So, if uh, any commissioner would like to start this off on the owner initiated ones, remember there are four properties that we're principally that we're talking about: 3301 Kerner, miscellaneous Caltrans properties, 86 Culloden Park Road, and then the 435 Dubois, uh, the Jackson's Hardware site. I'll, I'll take on the Jackson's Hardware site. Um, uh, it, it, you know, we need housing. We have a bunch of industrial. Uh, I understand it's a challenging site, and it would be close to an industrial area on the other side of the parking lot. But I think if you look at it, there's a parking lot, and actually there's some industrial that are closer to the front of some apartment buildings on um, on Woodland. So, I mean, I, if if it's possible down the road the owner wanted to convert that into housing, it would seem like, I like Jackson's. I spent some money there, <laughs> so that would be a drag. But, um, I mean, I, I don't, I, I think there is still, there still will remain enough industrial to um, service San Rafael and Central Marin County. Just a thought. Anyone else like to weigh in? Oh, well, 
I can weigh in on Caltrans. I, I agree with staff there. It just doesn't make sense. Doesn't seem to make sense to change the designation on to undesignated. Um, with respect to the Jackson's Hardware site, it, it's sort of a tough call, right? Because it's not that close to transit. It's I think I remember in the staff report it's 0.7 miles. So it's not that close to transit in terms of walking. Um, at the same time, it is right across the street from what's already high density. And um, I probably, well, I don't, you know, I don't know how much goes into this of just the city not wanting too much of the land to be de residential in the sense that there's no sales tax related to residential. Is that part of the calculation when you're thinking about it? You know, I, I think industrial does have a pretty good amount of uh, tax generation, especially when you're dealing with like um, auto automotive and parts and things like that. But I would say that the, um, at least from the staff perspective and our economic development perspective, it's not the sales tax per se, it's more the loss of those services that provide a lot of amenities to not only San Rafael residents, but Marin County residents that people would have to go um, further to obtain auto repair or, or sprinkler parts or all the various types of things that you find in those areas. The, the other issue um, that from staff's perspective is that uh, there are certain uses that by nature will be a little more uh, obnoxious uh, by what they do and uh, when you introduce conflicting uses together it will either cause the new residents who live there to not be happy with their neighbors or it will cause the existing commercial or industrial businesses to feel like they're getting pushed out because of all the complaints so those were the main reasons behind I guess s at least staff's opinion um, I think the steering committee again had some various uh, uh, kind of a wide-ranging debate and differing opinion on the matter as well so it's not it's not a it's not a clear-cut slam dunk issue there's definitely pros and cons to both both directions other comments yeah I mean I think go ahead you sure I mean I think um, you could argue that the n the gross to net definition is going to enhance the density overall in many other areas right so from the housing standpoint we're looking that's going to allow for other opportunities from a broader perspective. So if you keep that high perspective there where we're trying to enhance housing, then you look at something like this of an existing use, which I think you've said very well, that may have noxious or challenging issues for residential others. It, you isolate it in this area. What I would want to think from a long-term vision planning is, is that the area we want to isolate it in and are we eventually going to turn it into an island which could force a general plan amendment or something like that. So I'm fine keeping it, but I think there needs to be a, an understanding as to if we keep it now, um, what's the potential risk, of what, what could be lost by the owner? If it's near transit and you have all these exemptions and potential enticements for it to be developed in something different, are we setting it up for them to come back and push an amendment later on? So. I would at least consider or kind of have a better understanding of that. I don't know the site well enough to get a feel for it, but I, I can imagine if there is funding and an enticement for it to be improved on, then they may want to come back. So if there's a, a need to analyze it more, then why not? But again, I think you can offset it by arguing the definition change helps increase density, which allows sort of a softens this not being housing opportunity. Commissioner Davidson, did you want to comment? I just have a comment going back to Canal Ways. Um, just my personal involvement with Canal Alliance and the issue that they're dealing with on the investment zones, it seems to me that that property is looking very, very attractive for a future affordable housing project. And I do recognize that there's a wetland overlay on that property and um, in my opinion those wetlands are not very significant and can be improved upon similarly to the 
Autobahn Society's project that is happening just north of that. And uh, we have an opportunity to enhance the wetlands and then another two unique opportunities of that property, and this is just wearing my engineering hat. I ha we have an opportunity to um, do the much needed levy reinforcement uh, that's pretty much holding the water from entering into that whole area. And, um, and also, I see it as an opportunity to actually build a, a project that can be adaptable to sea level rise. I am really, really desperate to see something being built that takes into account sea level rise because I feel, again, from my engineering hat, that we have studied it to death, but we're not building anything that's gonna tell us how we're doing in five or 10 years. So I just want to express my interest in, in that property as a really good opportunity. So I would support um, uh, maybe not, not removing oversight over whatever comes to that property, but I think it has a really strong restriction with the wetland overlay and perhaps the, um, I forget the zoning, but they're, they're still gonna need to come in and do a full-blown um, EIR and anything they need to do when they're exploring any proposal. So I just thought I tell you my personal <laughs> feeling of our property. Anyone else want to weigh in? Uh, I have comments on 435 Dubois, which is I think at this point I'm in favor of retaining the um, industrial uh, designation. Um, probably for many of the reasons Mr. Boloyan uh, art articulated. I, I, I can envision uh, a day coming when that becomes a housing opportunity site because other things have changed. Uh, a lot of the industrial uses in our city are devoted to automotive uh, things, although this area is, is, a lot of the industrial in this area, if, if I recall, is kind of related to construction. Uh, trades and then Jackson's kind of that particular business uh, uh, fits fits in, into that. I, I'm just afraid that you know once we give away that designation, we we don't really have anything to replace replace it. And I I think it's what makes San Rafael special that we do have that part of our our city that is 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 a, a working city and that pr provides services. Um, and uh, manufacturing and other uses and sales of, of products that are not available in other uh, cities and localities in, um, in San Rafael. So I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to housing at the site and it is a head scratcher because there are, is the existing multifamily housing right across, right across the street. And so it's, it's, it does make you, make you wonder about what's, what's gonna happen there. I don't think, you know, Jackson's is not a, that particular operation is not as noxious as some others m might be, but I'm for those reasons I would I would want to ma uh, maintain that. I'm sure this has been hard fought in the in the committee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Any other comments before we uh, f finish up uh, this items? Does staff any have any other follow up questions of the of the commission? N not at this time. The feedback has been very helpful, though. Thank you. So I think we've finished with this item, and thank you very much. Uh, staff has really done a good good job on on this so far. Okay, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna move on to the next item on the uh, agenda. If everyone's ready, uh, that is the I guess this is a continuation of the annual meeting of the Planning Commission, and uh, by way of introduction, uh, at the first session of the annual committee committee annual meeting of the commission in January, we discussed some proposed changes to the rules and regulations governing the, the commission. One of those rules was how to deal with uh, the need for a quorum on matters where the um, commission was not going to take action. The second was related to ex party um, uh, disclosures of ex party communications and potential conflicts and I had proposed uh, a change to the rules in the part about the order of speaking that would ask the chair to call for 
any disclosures that any commissioner wished to make uh, before the ma be before the matter, uh, the sp specific project matter was uh, called. We did not take action on that particular uh, matter uh, that night, and since that time, staff has done some more work on the issue and has received the input from uh, council uh, to the city on that. And, and with that introduction, I'll kind of turn I'll turn it over to staff now to lead us on to the to the to the next part of the. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Chair and Commissioners, the, um, at the annual meeting, there was quite a bit of discussion about the um, ex parte communication and um, what, what occurred at that meeting was a request to have staff seek advice and input from our city attorney um, regarding the level of detail and information that was to be, that, that planning commissioners should, should discuss or disclose at during the ex parte communication discussion. And so we, staff has done that, um, has discussed with our city attorney and um, recommended um, in, in concert with the city attorney's input, recommended some changes to the initial uh, um, edits to the rules and procedures. And basically what the conversation was with the city attorney is, um, that disclosures uh, that there should be n there should not be detail in the rules and procedures um, because we can't really it would be difficult to ha um, really anticipate all of the you know types of um, interactions that might occur and rather than have that detail it's um, typical for for planning commissioners to be responsible for their own just you know making sure that they're disclosing whether there's a concern with of um, that there might be a conflict of interest or that there might be some sort of um, communication that occurs. Um, what we heard as well from the, from the city attorney is that each planning commissioner is responsible for making sure that happens and that staff and the city attorney is available to um, have that interaction if there's a question about whether that ex parte communication or the conflict of interest has occurred. Um, and that we are, you know, we would weigh in, we, we would be happy to provide that input. Um, um, the other question that came up was just, you know, when, uh, what constituted a quasi-judicial action? Um, and the response that we got is pretty much everything that the planning commission is taking action on is considered a quasi-judicial action. Um, Except with not legislative actions, not like what we were doing tonight to work on the, on the on the general plan. But it, but uh, as I I think uh, city council with whom I had an opportunity to speak this af this afternoon as well defined it as any quasi judicial action is any action to issue, amend or deny an entitlement, and that's probably consistent with your understanding, Commissioner Mercado. Um, yeah, I mean, recently it's been a little bit more expanded. So, arguably tonight, even though it was a general plan, plan consideration, if this was the final recommendation, there's an argument that there is an underlying entitlement that's affecting certain applicants. So, I would err and be conservative every time. Um, the trend right now seems to be that our type of body is almost always quasi-judicial. So, as a commissioner only, I would, for myself, um, disclose anything I if I thought there was a concern and, um, you know, work with the city if needed to, to talk about that, but keep it general. That's sort of the easiest way to do it so that way um, there's no ambiguity that we forgot something later um, and really just allow kind of us to keep the, the discretion as to keeping it broader than narrower. I have to say that I find this incredibly vague, and, and, and the reason why is because, so it's saying ex parte contacts are substantive, oral, or individual written communications with whom, it does not say, um, concerning quasi-judicial matters that, that occur outside of notice public hearings, in what time frame? And, and about what? A specific, I mean, it seems to me that it needs to be clear who, that you are having conversations with the applicant about the issue before the panel. I think it's uh, intentionally left broad because it will. Okay, it's not just broad. It's it's completely unspe unspecified. 
So how can you follow a rule that's that's so unspec that unspecified? With I mean, you could just completely. Do you, do you see my point? I mean, for example, Jeff disclosed that he was at some point in time a lawyer for Jackson's Hardware. That doesn't, it, it, based on this, I would say that's not, would not, you would not need to disclose that. Actually, I make that disclosure for, uh, on the grounds of a potential conflict and on the grounds of my professional responsibility as, as a lawyer to not use confidential information of a, of a former client. So I get that out there so if the client were to, if, if Jackson's were to come in and say, you know, you're making this decision based on information that you acquired while you were working for us and it was confidential, then it'd be a problem. So this just gives gives that former client an opportunity to to uh, uh, speak up. But but you're right. And, and if I, and if I may respond to your thing, I, I think you're you're absolutely right. This is a it's a tricky area, and um, it, 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 we probably could benefit from some more general guidance without, because th there may not be bright lines on, on everything, but just a sense of, of what individual commissioners ought to be thinking about in terms of deciding whether to make a disclosure or, or not. And that's, I, I, I have the same, I struggle with the same, same thing you do. Is it, you know, and it, it, it's basically the idea that you don't, you don't want to be making a decision that is based on information that you acquired that wasn't available to, to the to the rest of uh, of the public without giving the public or the applicant an opportunity to respond what, to what might be going on in your head by reason of the receipt of that information in an ex party matter. An ex party means you got it without notice anybody on the other side seeing it. You you want to help out? Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm wondering, um, it, because I'm seeing this as, let's explore this more as a possible um, direction that your commission may may go, but, I, you know, if we did go, if we did go back and try to get some additional information or, or different language that made it more specific, is there, you know, just kind of thinking about the direction we got from the, our city attorney in terms of trying to keep it broad and not specific and just, you know, holding the, having the planning commissioners individually responsible for making sure that they're disclosing situations where they may feel like there might be a conflict of interest and with you know understanding that staff and the city attorney is available to provide that feedback if there's a question about whether there's that conflict of interest or the need to disclose you know trying to i guess I'm trying to figure out a, a situation where we might be able to include every possibility in this language. And I so have I a don't know. I have a, I have a suggestion. Um, you know, may, maybe it would be helpful to have just a, a memo, you know, whether it's written by the city attorney or, or maybe there's there's already a memo that's already been written that's thorough and well done um, that isn't, you know, that doesn't need to be part of this, but which that can be used as a resource for commissioners. You know, not. And that, yeah, and that's actually a really good point. One of the things that we have talked, we did talk about was, um, you know, coming, putting together a list of, you know, instances where that might be, where the disclosures might be appropriate. Not part of the rules and procedures, but separately as a memo, as a guide to each of the commissioners that you could have before you, you know, at each meeting. Um, so I would, um, I like with yeah with I, I like this spe specifically with examples of where that help people to understand where the line might be. So I would just I would recommend staff consider the Cal California League of Cities has a memo on brown act bodies that has example examples and hypotheticals that will walk you through when or may when a disclosure should or shouldn't be made and it will explain what is ex parte what's substantive and then procedurally what the timeline is that you would need to do it. Because if something has already passed or if it's still not contemplated in our jurisdiction or if it's not in our jurisdiction, there may not need to be a need to disclose. So I think you, you raise a great point of there's some written memos out there that maybe the city attorney could tweak a little bit to identify a couple of examples that maybe would be more germane to us. Um, and unless I'm wrong, don't, I mean, we all have to, through a forever video 
which describes in just enough detail to be ambiguous uh, every couple of years um, about what our responsibilities are um, in terms of um, uh, stating any conflicts we might have, I, th I think. I, I, we might, I mean, we, we might be looking for something that's not there. Unless we're doing something wrong, is the state trying to crack down on something? Are there, are there issues of gross negligence at planning commissions? I, I don't know. It seems like we have, it hasn't been an issue thus far. Not that I'm looking for more rules, but um, I don't know. I, I just want to know with whom, communication with whom. Because, I, I mean, I would assume that's the applicant, but at one point, Jeff, um, you disclosed that you had gone to the site with a member of the staff. Is that, so I, I guess my point is I want to know communications with whom. It's with anyone that may impact your decision and what's in front of you at that time. That's the simplest way to think about it. Okay, so you talk to a friend? Potentially. If that friend says something to you that impacted how you would respond and you've already made your determination, you should probably disclose it. But if you and your friend are just chatting and she raises a really interesting issue, just write it down. You can add it to a comment you want to make. That's fine. It's really if you are communicating with somebody where they say something to you that's impacted your ability in a quasi-judicial situation to be objective and take all input. Okay. If that's kind of yeah. the disclosure. So yeah. it can be the applicant. Okay. It could be a colleague. It could be a neighbor. What about a, like a newspaper article or, or some article that one has read? Does that would that qualify? I think only if you uh, only if disclosure? you think it's going to be conflict. If it's I think if, if you listen to what uh, commission, uh, pardon me for interrupting, but I think if I want to follow up with what Commissioner Mercado said, the the test is is whether the information you received that wasn't in the staff report, that wasn't available to the to the rest of the public, is something that you consider um, important uh, it, or affects your decision making on the matter before you. That's that's the word substantive. That's uh, am I am I right about that, Commissioner Mercado? Yes. So to the point of like an article or whatever, the public had access to that. So arguably, they could have read it. If it's something that's really that bearing, we could send it to staff and ask it to be a, an amendment to the agenda, and then everybody could see it. Um, th that, I think, is fine. It's truly when it's something that is ex parte in fashion, which is really that it's only you and the other person were privy to that conversation that impacted your ability. If you think it's going to make you biased or impartial, then the disclosure is in order for the public to be aware of, oh, Commissioner Mercado met with so-and-so. I, as the public, I'm going to ask him about that, and I have to answer that and flesh it out more. So this is really, again, the Brown Act is really, it's a disclosure consumer advocacy legislation, right? It's to allow the public to know that we're not all meeting individually with people predetermining what's going to happen. So as long as you, that's why I say I just err on the side of just disclosing it, because it, then it's out there, and the burden is now shifted from off of you to anyone else who wants to question that. But later if it comes out, which does happen, and the Attorney General looks into it, the failure to disclose, then the, sh the burden shifts back on you to explain why you didn't think you needed to disclose. So I just err on, if it's quasi-judicial, just put it out there, make it very simple, very broad, spoke with some applicants, spoke with the neighbors. I think if you keep it that, then everyone knows how you've been looking at it. And you know, if you want more detail, because maybe something was done that you're concerned about, then. I would take it to staff, and then you could work with the city attorney. So, Commissioner Lochran, I think your uh, your your questions and your comments are are well taken. Uh, the purpose of the the language that's proposed here doesn't answer all the questions that uh, you or others of us may may have. All this does is gives a a place for the chair to say, before we get started, does anybody want to disclose? Uh, either a potential conflict or an ex parte communication with respect to this agenda matter. And then that, then there's no, you don't have to decide, well, what point do I, in the proceeding do I, do I say it? And it's just done. You could, you, if you have nothing to disclose, there's nothing to disclose. And if you want to disclose something, you can. This, this is just our rules. Just make sure that we remind ourselves of that duty uh, of disclosure. And then there's going to be some more work to decide whether and how much you have to have to uh, disclose, and this rule is not going to answer all those those questions for you. But it's but it's it's, it's going to remind you that there there's some thinking to do ahead of the of meeting on that issue. Okay. 
Okay, but this does define what, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but what is here is that the chair will ask for it and then it defines what it is. So if we need to be comfortable then with the definition of what it is, <coughs> unless we're, if that continues to be in this document. Uh, Commissioner Mr. Schaefer. My concern is, and I, we, talk, we talked a little bit about this, and so I'm hesitating because I don't want to just rehash discussions from, from what, a couple of planning, mission, planning commission meetings ago. But I, I feel like this is a, a circumstance in which we're, we're trying to fix something that I don't, I'm not sure it's broken. Um, you know, as an attorney, I see that there are so many darn laws being passed and rules being imposed on everybody, and I feel like this is just one more rule that's being imposed that's just we already know, this, we already know this, and we have to go through the ethical um, education over and over and over, you know, and, and uh, I mean, I've done that a million, so many times. Um, it just, it feels like one more rule that's being, I mean, which I already know, but it's like, it's just another layer of just <laughs> on the shoulders, I don't know, of that's, un that's not necessary. And then not only that, but um, a, a, this concern of, it is vague, and could it then at some point be held against uh, some planning commissioner in an unreasonable way because of its vagueness and the fact that it's uncertain? And so I'm concerned about how this might be wielded at some point against a commissioner in an unreasonable way w because it lacks clarity and definition. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't see that there's been one instance since I've been on the planning commission where there's been a problem with their failure to disclose and, and, and it's caused... Again, I just I'm not sure I see the the problem that's being fixed, uh, and I, I see only the potential for uh, for the a, a rule that's vague as being misused against a commissioner. Commissioner Davidson, I feel that <laughs> we have to go to the uh, League of Cities and find the PowerPoint presentation that was um, <coughs> excuse me shared with us when uh, when he and I went to the Planning Commission Academy, and I think that's where the conversation got triggered, right? Because we saw this, uh, this presentation about Planning Commissioner's uh, role and what to disclose and, the, and their, um, the consequences of not disclosing. And I, I think we, we would all benefit from looking at that PowerPoint presentation. I'm, I'm really comfortable with how it's written because I understood more than I did before what it meant to not disclose and as a big umbrella it's really clear in my mind that anything that can be brought up to me in any future that oh this is why you voted this way and that way that it, uh, there's so many things that could influence that that it's hard to to write them all down so for me the way I think about it is can anybody later come to me and question, oh, you voted for this because you had this conversation with so-and-so, or because you you didn't tell me you were friends with so-and-so, or you didn't tell me that. So it's it's kind of my own sense of, uh, I guess, healthy ses sense of paranoia that like, oh, this could be a problem, so I'm gonna just say it. Again, I, I would volunteer to look for that PowerPoint. I can contact them and share it with the commissioners and hoping they can review it and see if they feel more comfortable about the topic and then we can discuss it if, if they don't feel comfortable about, about voting on it. I'm, I'm ready to accept it. If, if I may respond to, uh, again, to uh, Commissioner Lochran's concern about the, the definitional language, which, um, like you, doesn't help me. <laughs> I don't look at that and know what's quasi-judicial. I don't look at that and know what's, sub what's substantive. I don't necessarily know from that what is a, an uh, oral or a written communication. Uh, uh, but I believe that that, s that language was suggested by the city attorney as being, as reflecting existing law, that that is what, you, that is what you've got to do. Then the, the harder part is going on and saying, well, what does that what what does that mean? But this is the standard, and I I kind of ask Commissioner Mercado if he if he agrees with that characterization. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's fine. It, you're not going to be able to answer all of it in one disclosure statement, unfortunately. So us as a board need to figure out what the balance is between a CYA statement generally as a commission so that nobody can invalidate a decision we make and the comfort of each of us individually to feel like we disclosed everything without going, I spoke with my neighbor, I spoke with my friend, you know. You don't, you don't want either because then that also chills the public because they're just like, this is ridiculous. I won't talk to you. So you have to find the balance. So it is because of the trend in quasi-judicial having a higher level of scrutiny under agent uh, commissions like us, this is erring on the side of being conservative. I would recommend that we consider the city attorney maybe coming back with an explanation of this, the PowerPoint, the, the Cal League of Cities that explains it so we can look at that so people can understand it. And then as a commission with a bit more of that context, we determine if this is what we want or if we want to expand or narrow it down. I don't think this is a sword that would, is intended to come after us later. Because again, if there's a, a failure to disclose, then they could invalidate the decision we made. It's not that they would come after a commissioner. It's we would then lose that decision we made. It would be reasons to overturn it. So since we don't want that, we want to, as a group, make sure that we all understand what we're disclosing. I would say, let's educate a little bit more and then get this language cleared up. Non-lawyer, just a commissioner, I think it's a little overkill. I think the ex parte contacts, that it, I don't think you need all of that. I don't think the public gets it. However, I think we should have the memo that explains it to us what it is we're doing that when we say, I have nothing to disclose. Because there are certain commissions that you have to do that affirmatively every time prior to taking a quasi-judicial action. The commissioner will ask roll call, do you have something to disclose? No, 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 no. So there is that level of scrutiny that can be done. I think for us and what we do, I'd rather educate us and then agree what that provision will look like. That works really well. Other thoughts? So at this point, I, I, I tend to agree with Commissioner uh, Mercado, and uh, I know we have two items on this tonight. One is cleanup language on the non-quorum re requir requirement. And my question, I guess, to the staff would be, how important is if we get that, that, clean, <laughs> that cleaned up, or do we want to uh, defer and, and have you go, uh, I, I I guess I'm trying to figure out how we're, how we're going to accomplish this goal of educating the commission sufficiently so that we can make a more informed decision on the, uh, on the language for ex parte disclosures in the, in, um, in the rule. And I, it, does any, before, before staff responds, does any other commissioner want to address that? Well, I guess I just had a suggestion that basically we change it to say the chair shall ask commissioners to make any disclosure, ex parte disclosures or conflict of interest disclosures or whatever, period, that's it. And we don't go on in this document then, then to define them because I don't, I don't care for this definition. I think we could get education from s the city attorney as to what that means, but I don't think it should be, I don't think it needs to be in this document. If we feel like it needs to be asked, really what this is, this is the order of speaking. That's what we're talking about, right? So if we want to put in there that the chair needs to ask this question, I'm great with that. But I don't want to then go on in this document to define it in this vague way. I'm okay with that because that was my original proposal. Sure. Yeah, I'm fine with that as well. I mean, I think if the motion is to take the language without the blue edition of ex parte contacts are, and then it's intended to be defined. I'm fine with that. Uh, I think the other, the second, um, this, the additional changes about quorum, I think those are good changes as well. So I would be willing to make a motion to take, to uh, accept the proposed changes to the planning commission uh, rules and procedures as identified in the staff report. But 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 excluding the uh, ex parte disclosure, uh, the second sentence. Yes, excluding the ex, excluding the definition of ex parte uh, 
context. Yeah, I'm just making sure it's the only place. So yeah, in paragraph 2C1, ex party contacts are substantive oral or individual written communications. We don't need that in there. I would, I would approve the rest and delete that. Is there, is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Further discussion? Actually, for, you know what? I think that's reasonable. I don't think that's too burdensome. It's going to take a second and, uh, at the meetings. Uh, and if some issue arises, you know, hopefully the issue can be addressed before the meeting. So I would just encourage people to be thinking about this before the meetings, especially. Um, not j I mean just in any event, but so. Can, would it be okay for me to add, Chair? Um, when we send out the agenda, we could, you know, maybe at that point, uh, have you contact me if there's a question about whether there's any a need to disclose, and we can check with our senior attorney so that when we do come to the planning commission on that date or even before that, that we can provide you with some guidance. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Any further discussion? If not, I'll um, call for the vote. All in favor? It's been, it's been moved and seconded that the proposed changes identified in to uh, proposed changes to the um, Planning Commission's rules and regulations as set forth in the staff report be adopted with the exception of the exclusion of the, the sentence in section 1.2.c.1 that reads ex party contacts or substantive oral or individual written communications concerning quasi-judicial matters that occur outside of the notice public hearing. All in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Opposed. Uh, any abstentions? I vote aye. The motion carries. So I would, I do, st I do still think that uh, myself and probably at least one other commissioner of up here would benefit from some more education about what kind of things we ought to be thinking about uh, uh, d disclosure. For you know, for example, I wasn't even aware that, uh, that you know that there was a difference of opinion about what constitutes a, a quasi-judicial. Uh, matter and some council believe it wouldn't occur, it would not apply to what we were doing tonight. But I agree with your, your your reasoning is to me persuasive, and so I think we would we would benefit from having a little more uh, education. I don't know if it's part of a study session or how the best way to to approach that. Kind of leave it to staff to figure out how to how to, how to organize that or listen to uh, other commissioners for suggestions they might have about how we would better educate ourselves. I think we're over lawyering this whole issue. If someone is interested in it, they can go research it. They can go find the memo or maybe uh, Commissioner Mercado can find it and send it to him. I voted yes so that we could try this on for a year and then decide whether to keep it. Um, but I, you know, I, 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 I feel like I'm, I'm sufficiently educated at this point and everybody can educate themselves to their own satisfaction if they if they need to I, I think um, if I can um, just suggest that I, I could try to find that information and just send it to you guys individually and um, you can look at it and in the future if you feel like a study session is necessary we can do that but I, um, so how do you guys I mean, one beginning place is that is the memo that was circulated at the January meeting, the, the written by the, the Santa Barbara City Attorney, uh, which has been relied upon by the San Rafael City Attorney in rendering advice about this the subject to this commission. Okay, so uh, moving on to uh, the director's report. So I just have a couple of things. Um, the at the annual meeting, we talked about assigning um, uh, commissioner members to the DRB meetings, and we have, I put together, I typed it all up, and you should have it at your in front of you tonight. Um, I did want to remind um, Commissioner Lubomirsky that we have another uh, DRB coming up soon. I'll be, I'll be contacting uh, my present commissioners. I can't make that meeting. Something okay. came up, so I'll, I'll, okay. I'll do my best to tell them. Okay. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that our next meeting, um, 
beyond that is March 3rd. Um, we have a couple of items on that agenda for um, conceptual design review. Um, I wanted to mention that we had the annual planning commissioners annual conference on February 1st and um, a couple of commissioners were there. I was there. It was actually really interesting. I don't know if any of either of you want to mention anything that you thought was interesting. Yeah, it was, it was it's always fun to go and um, just realize, you know, the, the nature of development now and wildfires, what a huge impact they have and um, climate change, it was, it was really interesting. So I, I weigh in on that too. Uh, there are four different topics uh, covered, a couple of which weren't as interesting as, as others, but on uh, uh, the effect of um, wildland fires on planning, there was an in interesting pres uh, presentation by a fire scientist. Uh, and one of the, I, one, the point I remember him making, and there were several points that were good and some very interesting slides that in his in his presentation was that many times local planning jurisdictions rely on uh, the judgment of fire suppression uh, professionals to, to tell them what's what's okay and what what it, what isn't and the fire suppression professionals don't necessarily understand larger regional uh, factors in, in, in fires. And so I think, I think probably what he was saying is the, the, fire, the fire service people come to you and say, yeah, we can protect that house or that small development without considering will there be a fire there, how will a fire get there. So that, that was my takeaway from the wildland fire. The, the second topic that was interesting was on um, the status of um, um, uh, statewide housing legislation and uh, it particularly in, in response to the recent defeat of, uh, of the Wiener SB 50 uh, bill. But the state is, has, other, has other irons in the work and uh, there were some very pertinent questions asked about, about uh, what, uh, what, what, what HCD's opinions are on certain matters asked by, by some people in attendance. But uh, the, my takeaways from that were, were twofold. Number one is, Rena numbers are increasing. Those are, those are going to come, and there's probably no no way to to avoid that. And then the second one was a a, a very interesting presentation of the results of a survey conducted by the L.A. Times, asking people what they thought were reasonable solutions to the housing crisis. And then people were acknowledging that it was a shortage of housing. And the number one. Uh, uh, response: Twenty-nine percent of the people indicated that it was uh, there was a, a need for rent control, and then and then the second highest response was uh, more funding for affordable housing. And way down at the bottom, in the nine percent range, was was changing any kind of uh, density uh, reg regulation. So, kind of a, a, a disconnect. And then that that same speaker also presented us a, a slide that that sort of painted the economic picture in California of the disparity, the, the diverging curves on uh, rent levels that are going up this way and the income of renters that are going down this way. So it, it, was, it, it painted a picture was of what was going on. It was well, well worth a while morning and the breakfast was much better this year. So I have one more thing. Um, we have uh, announced uh, the associate planner position available again. Um, we tried the first round. We were able to find one planner that we're gonna that will be starting in March. But if there's anybody out there watching our planning commission meeting tonight interested in an associate level planner, I'm <laughs> I shamelessly <laughs> asking, go ahead and apply. This it's an opportunity. It's a great place to work. That's all I have. Thank you very much. With that, we stand adjourned.